Now, today's a special day for Casey and I, first baptism ever, uh, so really exciting for us. And then what an amazing worship set, and we've got a nice, beautiful room. You know, look out here, I'll, I'll tell you guys a quick joke. Some of our, our guys were nervous about getting baptized up here. This is going to be a bad joke, by the way. And um, hold on, babe. Some of our guys up here were nervous uh, about the room being full, and I said, you guys don't have to worry about anything because the lights are going to be really bright. And they were like, okay. I said, yeah, you won't be able to see anybody past the lights. And I said that for me, you know, when I get up and preach, I can't see anybody out there. They're way too ugly. So, the, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Casey's shaking her head. So, now you guys are a beautiful crowd. But it did get them laughing, which did help them to feel more comfortable. You guys are beautiful. You're not ugly at all. But speaking of me being mean on stage, we're talking about mean people and what to do about them. Now, this is an important thing for us to talk about because we all deal with mean people. We've all got somebody that is in our life that has been mean to us. In fact, when I say mean people, if it wasn't me that came to mind for telling a bad joke, there's probably somebody else that came to your mind because we all have that person in our life, either now, currently, presently, or somebody in the past that has been mean to us in a way that has impacted us negatively. And that impact in a lot of us, it continues and it continues to impact our life and affect our life. So today we're not talking about what to do, or we're not talking about mean people as in what they deserve. Or we're not talking about mean people as in how do you not become a mean person. Instead, we're looking at the reality that we live with, that the world is full of mean people, and we can't do anything about it. So if we can't do anything about the fact that there's mean people in the world, then we can at least learn what to do about them. And that's what today's message is about, is what do we do about the mean people in our life? And this is important. We have to have a plan for this, because if you don't have a plan for dealing with mean people, then they're going to just gain a measure of control in your life. If we don't know how to deal with mean people in our life, they will end up controlling more and more of our lives. And in fact, having people... So, so here's, here's the... Let me put it to you this way. There's a... I think about like the, the toilet bowl circle because it doesn't lead you to a positive place. And it's this hurting people because they hurt you. It, it creates this cycle, this perpetuating cycle of hurt. So someone hurts you and then therefore you hurt them. Someone hurts you, then you hurt them. And because you hurt them, they hurt you. And it just creates this perpetuating cycle. And then what it does, that we don't, we don't want this to happen, but it does happen, is we become like the person that we dislike. So now we're being mean to the person that was mean to us, which makes us like them. And so if we don't know what to do with mean people, then we end up creating these cycles. They have control of our life, and we end up going around the, the toilet bowl as we head to a worse and worse place, the further down to the drain that we get, as we kind of chase our tails with hurt people hurting other people. So we have to know what to do with mean people, and we have to know what to do with them when they encounter our life. Now, because we have mean people in our lives, there's a couple of truths for us, just to, for us to acknowledge. The, the first truth for us to acknowledge is that we can't be who we are, so we overcompensate and become someone different. We talked about this a lot last week. And this is, if you know in your life that there's a version of you that you keep a little bit quieter when you're around a certain somebody else, then that's you overcompensating. You saying, you know what, I don't want to deal with that bully. I don't want to deal with that mean person. I'm going to take this part of my life. I'm just going to quiet a little bit. Or I'm going to pump up this other part of my life so that I can avoid this person being mean. Now, the, the next thing that happens because mean people in our life, and this is one of the most dangerous, is that we become actually consumed. We become consumed with mean people. And, and they, they take over our, our headspace, they take over the real estate in our mind, and we just start thinking and thinking and thinking about this person. I call these like shower thoughts. You know, when you're in the shower, that's the best place to have an argument because you can always win that argument. Because it's just you and your mind playing out how you want this argument to go. And a mean person will end up consuming you inside and out. So I'm trying to build a case for you guys. That if you're not interested in today's message... I want you to at least be interested in this idea that you've got somebody in your life or you will have somebody in your life that is maybe mean to you. And I want you to know how to deal with that person in a way that they stop taking control over your life and they stop consuming the headspace that's in your life. So here's what I want for us today. Can today be the last day that you give somebody total control over your thoughts? 
Can today be the last day that you let yourself be completely consumed by somebody else? Can today be the last day that you walk around hurting people because they hurt you? Can we break the cycle today? Can we free up our mind today? Can we free up our spirit today? Can we let go and, and, and take back control that somebody else has over our life? That's what I want to see us get to the point of today. That's where I hope that we get to. Because we, we've got to deal with these people. Now, in life, there's a couple rules. We talked about these three rules last week. There's a couple rules that, that we try and live by. And we all know the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. If the whole world operated this way, then we would, not ha- we would never have an issue. There would be no issues at all. Because you would walk around and you would always think about the other person first. You'd say, well, okay, hold on. Before I act this way towards them, how do I want them to act towards me? I mean, the world would be a perfect utopia if that was the case, but we all know that that's absolutely not the case. It's not the case uh, at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning where you're trying to merge onto the M5. I thought about that again this week as I was trying to get onto the M5 to go somewhere. I got mad because someone wouldn't let me in front of them, and so I cut in front of them anyway, and then when someone tried to get in front of me, I sped up. Say no, 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 no. I fought for this position. You're not getting here. So, you guys know what it's like. I, I know you road warriors out there that you have to travel to work every day and you deal with this traffic every day. The golden rule doesn't even apply there. If it did, no one would ever go anywhere in Cape Town. We'd all sit at every robot that there is. So instead, we, we apply the silver rule. Do unto others as they have done unto you. So it's I'm going to give to someone else what they've given back to me. So this is that cycle, this hurt cycle. Well, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. Well, you did this to me, so you deserve this to happen to you. Now, this is something that we feel incredibly justified. We, we look at this situation, this rule in our situations with mean people, and we think, I absolutely can feel this way. They deserve it. They deserve to be hurt. They deserve for me to be mean to them. They deserve to pay a price. And so that's the silver rule. Now, the rule that we end up actually living by and the rule that plagues a lot of us and so many people last week, this is a bit of a recap from last week, so many people messaged me and said, I can identify with this. I can absolutely identify with this third rule because I do it all the time. And this third rule is the iron rule. Do unto others as someone else has done unto you. So because my mom hurt me growing up, I'm now going to take it out on my wife. Or because my boss is mean to me, when I come home from work, I'm going to take that out on my spouse. Or because I was, I was bullied as a kid, I'm going to take it out on my best friend or on whoever. The point is, with the iron rule, is someone has done something wrong to you. You can't take it out on them. You can't get back at them. You can't apply the silver rule to them and do unto them as what they've done unto you. So what you do is it's like a a tire about to pop. You've got to let pressure off somewhere. So instead, you let this pressure diffuse on other people in your life that don't deserve this. And so we walk around feeling upset and hurt and mad and confused and full of emotion. And and we've got these mean people that consume our thoughts and, and they hurt us. And we walk around, we don't know what to do with it. And without even knowing and realizing it, we end up applying the iron rule. And we end up hurting somebody else that isn't even involved and doesn't even deserve it. So then what do we do about mean people? Do we get even? No. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Do we get even? Yeah, some of us think yeah. But, but this doesn't quite lead us to freedom. Because getting even makes us like the person that we're getting even with. Do we ignore them? Well, that's impossible. We can't ignore them. In fact, when we do, they often mean people get meaner and meaner and meaner because they want a reaction out of you. They want something out of you. And so when you ignore them, it only gets stronger. It only continues to get stronger. And so that, that's where we sit with this idea of, okay, what do we do about the mean people in our life? What, how do we handle them? How do we get the freedom that we talked about? How do, we get, uh, how do we unchain our mind and unhinge ourselves so that we can actually find freedom? I don't know who wants to find freedom from a mean person today, but the option is there and the opportunity is going to be there. And we're going to find that and we're going to learn about that as we look at a guy named David. And David, as we look at him, David is actually 
the fugitive. So this is the same David, and we're looking at, at a section of his life. This is the same David, for those of you that don't know, that killed Goliath. I mean, even our three-year-old son, he knows about Goliath. There is a, a song that we listen to a thousand times in the car, and it, it talks about Goliath, and it has a dun-dun, Goliath, dun, dun I don't know any other parents that have heard this. But so Goliath was a big deal in our house. And so this is David that went up and he killed Goliath. And then when David killed Goliath, Saul brought him in. Saul was the king and Saul brought him in and said, okay, David's getting kind of famous. So Saul brings him into his court and makes him one of his trusted uh, uh, friends and advisors. And so David kind of gets folded into Saul's uh, kingship. And then because David keeps growing more and more and more and he gets more popularity, Saul ends up getting upset with him. And then Saul is mean to David. And the way it looked with Saul being mean to David is he tried to kill him. He threw a spear at him. He tried to take his head off. And basically Saul said, I'm going to get rid of David. And it was in Saul's best interest because Saul had a son named Jonathan. And Jonathan should have been king. But now there's been some random prophet who showed up at David's house who said, you're going to be king over Israel. And, and Saul hears this, and then Saul's watching it unfold as David kills Goliath, and David goes on to gain popularity with people. And so what Saul does is Saul hatches a plan to kill David, and David goes out on the run. So David is now a fugitive. And as a fugitive, he's got about 600 people that are following him. 600 men. And so then on top of that, their family and their kids. And so David basically has an army. So I want you to get this picture. This is a wild time. There's no real law that's happening out. When you get outside the walls of the kingdom, it's kind of a free-for-all. And so David's out there, and over time he collects these people, and he's got 600 rogue warriors. And these 600 rogue warriors become part of an army with David. And they're out in the wilderness, and they're taking over villages. They're stealing. I mean, David's story is incredibly brutal. When they wanted something, they went and they took it. They burned villages down. They killed every single person that was in it. David was, was a brutal fugitive. That's an important part of the story. Because what happens is, is David is living out in the wilderness. There's, there's a guy, a rich man. And this rich man named Nabal, he had a whole bunch of sheep. And these sheep had shepherds. And, and these sheep represented his wealth. Now, there came a time in the year where it was time for, for every person that owned sheep to shear the sheep. And that's kind of like getting a bank statement back and, under, and, and realizing how much money's in your account or how much interest grew on your account. You could have sheep, but the way you really knew how rich you were is when you sheared the sheep. That was like, okay, now I'm going to know what my payday is going to look like. So David is in the wilderness with 600 men. And he's been watching and protecting over these shepherds and over this flock. And it comes time for the person that owns this flock to shear the sheep. And so David wants to have, he wants part of the, of the prophets. Basically he's saying, let me have some of this. And so let, let me take you through just the beginning and the end of the story before we catch up today. We talked about this last week. So th this is how the story begins. In 1 Samuel 25, 2, a certain man in Mon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. So this is talking about Nabal. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep. That's a, that's a lot of sheep. I mean, if you think about the logistics of three thousand, I mean, that's, that's a ton of sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. And then in verse 3, it says, his name is Nabal, that's who we're talking about, and his wife's name was Abigail. She's going to come up in this, in this story. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman. I mean, they were, it's like they were writing about my wife, Casey. But her husband was surly and mean. Okay, that's not about me. But, <laughs> but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So what David ends up doing is David sends 10 of his men to go talk to Nabal and say, Hey, listen, buddy, we kept your people safe. And you're going to make a huge profit because we were in the wilderness and we, hey, we did a lot of bad stuff, but we didn't touch your people. We left your shepherds alone. We left all 3,000 of your sheep alone. So when you, when you cut those suckers, when you shear those suckers and you have extra, just think about me and my men. And Nabal hears this and Nabal says, hey, 
you're not getting any of my stuff. I never asked you to do that. I don't care who you are. In fact, in my mind, you're just somebody thrown out of a kingdom. So tough luck, and you can go on with yourself. So David's men come back, and they tell David this. Now, David, this is the opportunity where we see the iron rule come out in David's life. Remember, Saul was really mean to David, tried to kill him. David, who's supposed to be king, is running around in the wilderness without a kingdom, probably mad, a little bit frustrated, and he has this, this guy, Nabal, this nobody, who tells him, no, you're not going to have what it is that you're asking for. And David just blows a gasket. And so he says in verse 21, he, he says, I've, I've had it with this. And he's, he says here in, in the next verse, 1 Samuel 25, 21, David has just said, so he just said this, it's been useless. So all this time that I've watched these sheep, it's been utterly useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. And then David goes on in verse 22 and he said, this is where David makes this incredibly declarative statement here. May God deal with David. So when you talk about yourself in the third person, you mean it, I mean, it's time. You've really, you know, hit your boiling point. So David's referencing himself in the third person. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. So now here we have David. And this is where we're going to pick up the story moving forward. David is not the example of what to do with mean people. David is the example of how we respond to mean people. We let the iron rule apply to our lives. We let outside influences come and stress us out and put pressure on us. We let ourselves get entitled to think, man, I deserve better than this. And, it, and I deserve better than what I'm getting. And because this person is not giving me that, then they deserve to pay a price for it. So we walk around kind of like judge and jury deciding who deserves to pay a price for what they do or they don't do in our life and who doesn't deserve it. And that's exactly what David has made himself. David's made himself king already. But David is king of his wrong emotions. He's not king of the kingdom that God has told him that one day he'll get. And so we sit like David, king of our own emotions. And we say, I am decreeing. And that's what David has done here. I decree so severely that God's going to have to deal with me in the morning if I leave one single male alive. So David has made a plan to completely wipe this village completely out. They're going to be completely gone. Every male, including Nabal's two kids, completely gone. There will be nothing left. Just a bunch of, of women and children. And so that's where we pick up here. Now that is not the example that we want to live by. But now we're going to see how we want to learn to deal with mean people. So meanwhile, all right, put yourself in the setting. David has just made this statement, I'm going to go and I'm going to murder everybody in this place because he wouldn't give me a couple scraps of, of sheepskin, and I'm so upset about this. And then, meanwhile, something else is happening in the background. And this is where Abigail, Nabal's wife, comes in. And she's going to show us how we should handle mean people. So Abigail shows up. David's ten men have been there, and they've left. David's now decided he's going to slaughter everybody, and the deed is done. They're going to kill everybody and take all the stuff they wanted anyway. And so, meanwhile, one of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Abigail shows up, and a servant comes up to Abigail. I mean, think about it. She's probably a little bit stressed. And she says, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at him. And, and, and it's like everyone knew David's reputation. They knew that he came from Jesse. They knew that he was thrown out of Saul's kingdom. They knew he had an army of 600 men. Nabal didn't care, but guess what? Everyone else underneath Nabal did care, cared very much. That's why this servant runs up to Abigail. Hey, you're married to Nabal. Can you do something about this? So she says, hey, he insulted them. He insulted David. And then the next verse, verse 15, Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was ever missing. So these guys really did do a good job of taking care of Nabal's men. And she even goes on to say in verse 16, Night after night, day after day, a wall around us the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. So wow, David must have really brought some security to them. So at least everybody under Nabal feels like there's this 
this incredible security. And so, so the servant, she pleads with Abigail. She says, okay, listen, listen, please. And she pleads with her in verse 17. She says, now think it over. Please think it over. So she knows she's going to ask Abigail to do something hard because Nabal is a bit of a jerk. And she says, think it over and see what you can do. Please do us a favor because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. It means you too, Abigail. He is such a wicked man that no one can even talk to him. And so now Abigail, it's like she gets home. Many of you moms know this. You get home from work and your husband or somebody else kind of gives you like the download or you get home from the grocery store. You know, today Casey's asked, can I go to the grocery store without any kids? And I said, said, well, if the church prays for me, you can. Well, but when she gets home, you know what? There's a potential that I can meet her at the door and say, you're never going to believe what happened. Benjamin should be punished for this, this, and this. And why it never stopped crying and just kind of just, just word vomit the report to mom. Like, here it is. Here's everything that happened. So Abigail comes home. And the servant runs up to her and just word vomit, like, Abigail, oh my goodness, can't believe what happened. Nabal was here and these men showed up. Now they're going to kill everybody. Can you please do something about this? And so Abigail's soaking all of this in. And then Abigail responds. So she has a reaction. Here's Abigail's reaction in the story. We'll go to the next verse. Verses 18 and 19. So Abigail acted quickly because she's smart. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five says of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs and loaded them on donkeys. So she knew she had to feed about 400 to 600 people. So she's smart. She loaded all these donkeys up. And then in the next verse, Abigail, or then she told her servants, I want you to go on ahead I'll follow you, but she did not tell her husband Nabal because she knew that it wasn't going to do anything good. Nothing good was going to come out of this. And so now Abigail goes and she has this encounter with David. Now the way the scripture tells us, I imagine it to be this this very majestic thing that's going to happen. Okay, So there's a ravine and there's a mountain involved and Abigail's riding And she's riding into this ravine and she's on a donkey and she's got a whole bunch of other donkeys with her. And they're riding through this this beautiful, I imagine it, this beautiful wilderness. And and David and his men are coming down out of the mountain and coming down into the ravine. And there you have this amazing cinematic shot of Abigail and her lonely donkey and all the the stuff. And David and his, uh, actually it was 400 men because 200 stayed back to guard the camp. And they just meet each other right there. And we find that meeting here in the next verse. In verse 20, as she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. I wonder, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I wonder what she felt. I wonder what that felt like there. I wonder if she just, if she stood, you know, high on her donkey and said, no, I'm confident here. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. But we see as their conversation unfolds, they have this really, really important conversation. In verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and she bowed down before David with her face to the ground. So she submits herself to David. It's the first thing that she does. In verse 24, she fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. So she's saying, okay, please, please hear me. Please hear me here. Uh, David didn't expect this. I want you to remember through this whole conversation with Abigail, David made up his mind he was going to kill every single male in this village. He was going to kill every single one of Nabal's males. And now here's Abigail on her face saying, please listen to me. I have something to tell you. And so here's what Abigail says in the next verse. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my Lord sent. So she's trying to say, hey, David, slow down. We don't all, we're not all represented by, by Nabal here. And then in verse 26, it says, And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. You know why this is so important right here? This is so important because what I have highlighted for you in yellow, Abigail is speaking about a future that has not happened. 
Okay, so David's future, if it plays out, is David's going to go and murder everybody in the village. That's why, he's on the, that's why his men are on the march. It's done. In fact, David has said, may God curse me if I don't murder every single male in the village by the time they wake up. Now, Abigail is speaking into a future that does not exist. Now, I just want to pause for a second and say, if you don't have an Abigail in your life, then I pray that you find one. Because I know that in my life, it's been quite beneficial that I have a wife that's spoken a future over me that doesn't exist. A future over me that I haven't chosen for myself. And I hope that through community in this church, you can find somebody, whether it be a friend, uh, a spouse, a future spouse, hopefully, or, or whoever, but somebody, a mentor that can speak into your life a future that does not yet exist because we all need that. So Abigail looks at David and says, says the Lord has kept you from bloodshed, from avenging yourself with your, with your own hands. David's about to go avenge himself. And she's saying, no, 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 the Lord, hey, the Lord has kept you from doing that. Lord has kept you from making the decision that you're going to make. And then she goes on in verse 27, And let this gift, all this food and everything that you were going to come steal, here it is. Let this gift be presented to you, which your servant has brought to my Lord. Let it be given to the men who follow you. And then David, or she, she goes on in verse 28, and she says this, Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord. Because you fight the Lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you shall live. So Abigail is really buttering David up here. She really is. She's appealing to who she thinks David can be and who she hopes David can be rather than who David has decided that he is going to be. Isn't that interesting? That God has brought somebody into David's life to appeal to who he can be rather than who he has decided to be. Hey, if you've got somebody in your life, this is just a short aside here. If there's somebody in your life that is trying to appeal to the version of you that they think you can be, and it's different than the version of you that you've decided that you're going to be, can I just challenge you to pause? Just just pause for a second and consider what they're saying, because they may be saving you from a whole lot of trouble, from a whole lot of mess that you're about to make. And in fact, Abigail goes on, And we're almost done with her part of the conversation here. But she goes on to say, even though someone is pursuing you to take your life. So she's saying, David, I believe in you that you can be this man that God has set aside, even though. So everybody knew that Saul was after David. Even though Saul is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely. And the word that's used there in in the, the original text is it's like David's life will be bound up in a purse or in a wallet. Like it's secure, it's treasured, it's taken care of, it's not handled lightly, it's, it's valuable. And so she goes on to say, But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. What a clever, smart woman. She is speaking to David's insecurity, telling him he is valuable. And she is using the story of David using a rock and a sling to take down a giant as a reminder to David that, hey, it wasn't you that did that. It was God that did that. And now God will do that again for you. And she's about to ask David this question that we all have to ask ourselves. So put yourself at work, put yourself at home, put yourself in front of your spouse, put yourself in front of your kids, put yourself in front of a friend, put yourself in front of that bully that was 10 years ago that's still bothering you and hurting you. I want you to look at that person. I want you to ask yourself the question is, what story do you want to tell when this is nothing but a story to tell? And that's what she's asking David. David, you've decided to do this, but you know what? God has set you apart to do this other thing in your life. You don't have to have this man's blood on your hands. And she's saying, David, when you look back on this, when you're king, when you're sitting where God has has appointed you to sit, and you look back and tell this story, what story do you want to tell? When you, you guys, out there in the audience and online, when you look back, at the story of your encounters with your family, your friends, your co-workers, the bully in your life, your neighbor, whoever it is. When you look back on that and tell that story to somebody in the future, what story do you want to tell? How do you want this to play out? See, we all want to tell a good story about ourselves. 
But what we often need is we need somebody. We need an Abigail, which could be this church or the Holy Spirit or a friend or a mentor. We need somebody to speak over us who we actually can be rather than who we have decided to be. And so she asked David this question in verse 30. She says this. She says, When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel. So she's saying, David, when you're king, when everything comes true and you're king, guess what? Guess what, David? If you listen to me, you will not have to have his conscience. You will not have to have, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. Yeah, so Abigail is handling this quite well, I think. I think she's doing a pretty good job. I think at the beginning when it described her as intelligent, she's definitely showing that she has some emotional intelligence. And so David hears this. And what's David's response going to be? That he just kills her and we're done. Have a good day. There's free coffee outside. No. No. No, he doesn't. He does like every guy would do with a beautiful woman in front of them. He said he pauses and he thinks about this. And his response is really good. It's good because David had an open heart. And he took just enough time to pause. He paused an army of 400 people to listen to Abigail talk to him. And David's response is this. David goes through this and he says to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord God of Israel who has sent you today to meet me. Thank you, God, that you sent Abigail. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. And David continues on in the next verse. He says, Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and I have granted your request. Now, here's what David did that I hope that we can do. We need to listen to the people. We need to listen to the people who speak to our preferred future and remind us that what we want immediately will get in the way of what we hope for ultimately. So let me say that to you again because this is so important. Because when you're mad or you're hurt because someone's been mean in your life, you know what? If today's the day that you let go of that, if today's the day that you get freedom from mean people, if today's the day that you stop giving so much headspace to the people that have been mean to you in your life, then today's the day that you need to choose this statement right here over your life. Because I'm here to tell you, if you don't have an Abigail in your life, I'm here to tell you that there is a God in heaven. There is a God that loves you so much. There is a God that protects you. There is a God that believes in you and he is there for you and he is there to see you succeed and to see